Good morning. Pastor Kyle here at the Stillwater First United Methodist Church, and it's my honor to welcome you to our Easter morning worship service. We celebrate the good news that Jesus Christ is risen, that he has conquered death, light has returned into the world, casting out darkness. And so I hope that whatever you've experienced this past week, whatever your Holy Week has looked like, that you can let go of any doubts, fears, concerns that you have, and allow yourself to be enveloped by the light and the love of God this Easter. Experience that good news that Christ is risen as we now go live to the Stillwater First United Methodist Church. Welcome to worship at the First United Methodist Church here in Stillwater. Please rise and by your spirit and join us on this Easter Sunday.
Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Oh, Amen. My name is Pastor Kyle. Whether you're worshiping with us here in this space, you're worshiping with it via the YouTube live stream, it is an honor to be worshiping with you on this Easter Sunday as we come together as a family of faith to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so now we're going to continue with that worship as we sing together as children of light.
children of light open the doors go let it shine whoa, whoa, whoa. you to be seated. 
This morning in our first service, we commissioned a team of 14 people from our church and some other area Methodist churches that will be going to Bolivia. They'll be flying into La Paz on April 11th, getting there early the morning of April 12th. And then they will, the next day, travel four to five hours off-road to the remote Indian village of Capeque, where over years we've had a relationship with that group as First United Methodist Church here in Stillwater. And there you have built a medical clinic. You helped to fund a nurse to be there to care for those people. And we'll be going there to do work at the clinic, see patients, uh, provide medical care, as well as construction projects. So we appreciate your prayers for the team as they head out. And our mission candle is lit to the glory of God and that God bless the Bolivia mission team as they travel to be the hands and feet of God. And as they go, they take you with them because they couldn't go without your support. With that, I invite you to join with me in an attitude of prayer. Gracious and holy God, we do celebrate that Christ the Lord is the risen King. The lilies that grace this worship space shout the good news of that new life. Their colors and shapes dance with joy as they trumpet the news that Jesus lives. We also rise in hope and celebration at this great news. Our hopes and dreams have come true. We lift our hearts in praise for you have raised Christ from the dead and given to us new life. The journey towards the cross has been long. But it does not end here, for you call us to go forth and to witness to the good news of the resurrection and the power of God's love in Jesus Christ. Keep us open to the needs and hearts of others, for we are called to be bearers of your light and love to areas in which darkness still stands. As we come to present our tithes and offerings, may they be an affirmation of our search for the risen Christ, the one who challenges us to see beyond our own expectations. Bless these gifts and those whose lives will be touched by them. Help us to discover the transformative power of the living Jesus in our lives. It's in the holy name of our risen Savior that we now pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. dark and all alone, growing comfortable. Are you too scared to move and walk out of this tomb? Buried underneath the lies that you believed, safe and sound, stuck in the ground, too lost to be found. You're just asleep. And it's time to leave. Come on and rise up. Take a breath. You're alive now. Can't you hear the voice of Jesus calling us out from the grave like Lazarus? You're brand new. The power of death couldn't hold you. Can't you hear the voice of Jesus calling us out from the grave like Lazarus? Was more than blood, it's the kind of love that washes sin away. Now the door is open wide, and the stone's been rolled aside. The old is gone, the light has come, so come. Please join us and bow your spirit and rise as you're welcome. Take a breath, you're alive now. Can't you hear the voice of Jesus calling us out from the grave like that? Please come. 
walk out of the dark He's giving us new resurrected hearts Oh, He's calling us to walk out you to be seated. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. Let us hear the word of the Lord. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to the hands of sinners and be crucified, and on the third day rise again? Then they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves. Then he went home, amazed at what had happened. The word of the Lord to live and to share. Thanks be to God. It's been quite a journey to get to this point. For some of us, we've had a week filled with you know, parties and Easter egg hunts at school and in the community and here at the church. You know, a number of us maybe have taken pictures with, you know, cute little bunnies or sometimes kind of big, kind of scary looking bunnies. <laughs> you know, we've uh, maybe been through, uh, traveled far. You know, some of you may be here uh, worshiping with us with friends and with family that you've, you've traveled miles and miles to come and be with, to worship with us today. Those of you, there may be some of you worshiping online with us who have traveled far, far away from here. Uh, not to get away from us, but to go and be with family and you're worshiping with us remotely as well. Many of us have had a had a busy week, you know. We maybe we've we've been here for Monday Thursday as we remembered uh, the Lord's Last Supper with His disciples. Good Friday as we celebrated the crucifixion of Christ. Some of us, this is number six of seven services in four days. No one's counting or anything, but this has, you know, been a happening time uh, in our lives. Many of us maybe have traveled, you know, starting back from the beginning of the season of Lent with Ash Wednesday. We set out on that forty-day journey, not counting Sundays, towards Easter. A number of us have read through the Gospel of Luke in its entirety over those 40 days, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Some of you are here, and this is your, you know, 80th or 90th Easter celebration. Some of you maybe are here in this room or worshiping with us remotely, and this is your first Easter celebration. Regardless of what journey has brought us here today, I think we all come looking probably for something very similar. We come looking for, curious, is there good news? A message of hope and encouragement for us today. Which may have been very well some of what the women were looking for. Maybe hoping for, hoping beyond hope as they travel to the tomb. 
And so that's what we're going to do this morning. Is we're going to look at the story of the women as they headed to the tomb, see what their experience was and how it might impact or inform our lives of faith today as well. As we begin, let's do so with a word of prayer. Gracious loving God, we do give you thanks for this opportunity we have to come together to fellowship with one another and to worship you. It is my prayer, O Lord, that you would be present among us, whether we're worshiping here in this space or worshiping remotely on this Easter Sunday. I pray that you would unite us by your Holy Spirit. Fill, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Use me as a vessel speak, to speak through me to share with each of us your message of truth and grace this day. Amen. I want to start off by being honest with you. I'm not very good at waiting. I don't know if it's a generational thing. I don't know if it's a cultural thing. I don't know if I just wasn't blessed with the gift of patience, but I don't care to wait. I, I, you know, a lot of times maybe it's partly that I think I got something better to do with my time maybe. You know, I don't, I don't like to wait, you know, in the line at Walmart or Sprouts or at Sonic. You know, I touched that red bin button five minutes ago. Is there even anyone on the other side of this thing? <laughs> And another example, this past week, I, I needed to get the shot records for one of my kids. And so I, I called the doctor's office. I thought, I'll call ahead. Instead of just showing up, that might be an inconvenience. And so I'll call ahead. And, of course, you know, maybe this has happened to you too before. I called, and I put on hold. And after 15 minutes of being on hold, I realized to myself, you know, the doctor's office is 1.3 miles from my office. I could have gotten there faster than this. And so I hopped in my car and went down and got the records. And, 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 then, and then sometimes I, I have trouble waiting because I'm excited about something. I remember as a kid, maybe you had this experience as a child. I remember when I was little, you know, getting excited for my birthday or being excited for Christmas was coming up, you know. And, and I had trouble sleeping at night. And I would get so excited as the day got closer and closer that sometimes I'd catch myself, my teeth would be chattering with excitement. <laughs> I mean, who am I kidding? I still get excited about those things today as an adult as well. But as I was thinking about that this past week, about how I don't like to wait, I realize, you know, Kyle, you need to be honest with yourself as well and be truthful. There are some times that you do wait, and you're more than happy to do so. I don't know if this maybe any of you relate to this or resonate with this, but, you know, I'm honest. I I don't mind waiting when it is, uh, you know, waiting or, let's be honest, putting off that dentist appointment. (laughs) You know, I, I will wait until there's not a single piece of clean clothing in my closet before I will do laundry. I You know, I I will wait to have that difficult conversation, no matter how unhealthy I know it is to wait any longer, but I will put off as long as I can to have that conversation with my spouse, with a friend, a coworker, even though I know there's been a disagreement and there's some some pain there, because I just don't want to have that uncomfortable moment, right? So, so I realize that, you know, sometimes there are those times I'm excited and, and can't wait, but there's other times I'm happy to wait as long as it takes. I wonder what kind of waiting the women were experiencing on that day long ago were they ex- it was one of those excited waiting like they couldn't wait for the for the saturday to get over so that they could go to the tomb and, and do their duty of preparing jesus's body for a final burial or was it more one of those saturday can last forever for all i care type of waiting because they knew that to go to jesus was to go and to stand at the side of their lord whom they had abandoned because that's the story we read uh, in the chapter before what Pastor Cindy read for us. That on that Friday, as Jesus was giving his life, being crucified on the cross, his acquaintances, his disciples, his followers, and yes, the women, they all gathered themselves at a distance, and they watched from afar. They watched from afar as Jesus was crucified. They watched from afar as his body was taken down from the cross, wrapped in linen cloth, and carried and placed into an empty tomb. It was then that they began to prepare some of the spices and the ointments to, to finalize Jesus' burial. But then, you know, Friday came to an end, and it was Saturday. And as a reminder, Saturday is the day of Sabbath. It is, it is the day of rest for the Jewish holy people. And, and so there were lots of rules and restrictions about what you could do, how many steps you could take, any work that could be done. And so they had to wait. And there they waited throughout that Saturday until Sunday morning came, the first day of the week. The Sabbath had ended, and we're told they headed to the tomb at early dawn. Dawn is that, that time period, right, where the, you can start to see the light on the horizon to the east, but you can't quite see the sun yet. And when Luke tells us it's early dawn, I, I, that, that tells me that probably the moment that any light began to peer, pierce the darkness on the horizon, the women were headed towards the tomb. And they arrive to the tomb and they find the inconceivable, something they never would have imagined, the miraculous. They find that the stone has been rolled away and Jesus' body is gone. 
And so they go inside the tomb, and here they are in this place where they expected to find Jesus' body, this place of, uh, of death and darkness, and, and no one's there until all of a sudden, in an instant, you know, two men show up and appear there uh, around them. I mean, imagine how frightening that would be. Uh, my wife, Heather, she, she, she works from home, and so sometimes I go home uh, from the office for lunch during the day, and when I do, as I come in the garage, I have to make sure I make lots of noise as I walk through the house. You know, I'm, do- I'm knocking on doorways and as I'm stomping down the hallway because if the first thing she hears is me standing in the doorway of her office, she's likely to scream. <laughs> Just, it's happened many, many times. And so, so imagine what that would be like for those women there in that tomb. I mean, you walked in, you saw the tomb was empty, and now all of a sudden out of nowhere there are two people standing there with you. And they're obviously fear and filled with fear, also probably a little bit of awe acknowledging that these must be heavenly beings of some type, and they bow down to the ground, and it's there that the men say to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. It's kind of an interesting question, isn't it? It's, it's like they're looking at the women and they're asking them, Why would you, don't you know Jesus is alive? Why, why would you come and look for him in a tomb? I mean, I mean, because imagine you walk into an ice cream parlor and you ask for pizza. Or imagine you, you go to the Gulf Shores of Mexico and you ask the lifeguard, could you please point me to the nearest ski slope? It'd be, it'd be like walking into a cemetery and saying, can you tell me where the delivery room is for the new babies? I mean, if you, if you asked any of those questions, people would look at you like you had a screw loose, right? That's how the men look at these women. Why are you looking for Jesus in a tomb? Don't you know he's alive? And then they, they say these words, they say, remember, remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again. And then just as, if not even more important, it tells us, then they, the women, remembered his words. They remembered his words. They remembered his words about how he would one day suffer and die and be resurrected. And at the time, they probably thought it was like an analogy, a metaphor, you know, some public speaker's tool in order to ramp up the drama and get the attention of his listeners. But now what Jesus had to say takes on a whole new meaning there in that empty tomb. And and I imagine as they're remembering, they're probably thinking not only about his teachings, about his death, but they're also beginning to remember everything he said and they experienced around it. All the miracles that he performed, all the lessons that he taught, the stories that he shared. They probably begin to remember not only the things that they learned, but how they felt. How being in the presence of Jesus, they finally felt like they had value. In a world where they had been told they were worthless and had nothing to offer, here came someone, the Son of God, who said, You are beloved, and you are mine, a child of God. You have value and worth and something to offer God's kingdom in this world. They probably remember the joy, the peace, the hope they'd experienced in Jesus' presence. In my mind, it's as they remember, it's there in that moment that a little bit of light begins to break through the darkness of their waiting, their fear, and their sorrow. Memory is a powerful thing, isn't it? I mean, mean, it it, it stirs our emotions. Often it drives our actions and and who we are. And we have a choice. You know, what what things will I remember? Will I I remember only the bad things in life? Will I remember only the the criticism and the hardships and the losses that I've experienced and the the pain that I've had in my life? Or or we choose to also remember the good things, the the goodness and the beauty of God's creation, the, the friendships and the relationships we've made throughout our lives, the ways in which we've seen and experienced the grace and the love of God through the story of Christ and through the people around us. What will we remember? Speaking of remembering things, I, I'm reminded of a story by Max Lucado from his book, Grace. It's a story of two young women named Barbara and Regina, two young sisters. It takes place in 1755 during the height of the uh, uh, French and Indian War. Uh, as a reminder, it was a war that was fought mainly between uh, France and Britain, uh, but they kind of fought the war you know, here in the colonies a bit through proxy at times as they co-opted and, and, and brought upon different Native American tribes to fight on each side. And in 1755, uh, one of the Native American tribes that had been brought on to fight on behalf of the French uh, carried out a raid 
upon a number of, of British uh, settlements. And they call it the, the Pin Creek Massacre. And Barbara and Regina were in their home and they fled as their father and two brothers were killed. Barbara and Regina were taken captive along with a number of other children and they were marched westward. And as they marched day after day, obviously they were filled with fear and sorrow, grief at their loss, fear of what would come next. And, and each night as they were, uh, would try to go to sleep, they would sing together a song. They would sing a song that their mother had taught them and sang to them every night. Alone, yet not alone am I, though in this solitude so drear, I feel my Savior always nigh. He comes the weary hours to cheer. I am with him and he with me. I, therefore, cannot lonely be. Eventually, though, the captors began to divide themselves up, and they divided the captives as well. And on threat of death, Barbara had to let go of her younger sister, Regina. Barbara was brought to a village where she learned pretty quick the expectation is that the captives would no longer speak their native language. For her, that was German and English, and they were put to work. And for three years, she, she worked in that village until one day she finally had an opportunity to escape. And she ran for 11 days you know, through wilderness until she finally came, on, came to a colonial fort. And there she found the colonel and she begged them, please send some people to go and try to find my sister Regina. And they explained to her, we, we just can't. We, we wouldn't know where to begin. It's been so long. We wouldn't know how to find her. Barbara was reunited with her mother and one of her brothers had, who had survived because they were away from home at the time of the attack. And every day she'd remember and think about her sister. But over time, six years passed. Nine years now since the attack. And, and Barbara married, began a family of her own. She never forgot her sister. And then one day, uh, she and her mother got word 206 survivors had been recovered and brought to Fort Pitt, modern-day Pittsburgh. And would you like to come see if by any chance one of them might be your loved one uh, who was lost years ago? And understandably, Barbara and her mother hurried there as quickly as they could. And they looked amongst the survivors. They went up and down the line calling Regina's name. Regina, Regina, speaking in German and English. They didn't see anybody. They recognized as they looked in the face of every woman that was there. There was no recognition of Barbara or her mother. With tears in their eyes, they returned to the colonel and they said, she's not here. But the colonel pleaded with them. He said, are, are you sure? It, could there have been a piece of jewelry, a necklace, a bracelet that maybe she would have had on? Is there an identifiable mark, a birthmark, a, a scar of some type? Is there maybe a, a childhood story, something that would, would jog her memory and help her to remember who she was, who she is. It came to Barbara and her mother at the same moment. They ran back to the survivors and they began to speak again, but this time not calling Regina's name, not speaking in English or in German specifically, but instead they spoke in song as they began to sing. Alone, yet not alone am I, though in this solitude so drear, I feel my Savior always nigh. He comes the weary hours to cheer. I am with him and he with me. I, therefore, cannot lonely be. They didn't even make it entirely through the first verse. Before from the crowd of survivors, there was a, a loud outcry as a woman ran forward and ran to her long-lost sister and mother and embraced them, weeping. She could no longer speak English or German. She no longer recognized the face of her mother or her sister. But she remembered the song of faithfulness and of love and of comfort and of a God who is forever at your side. I imagine it was much the same for the women in that tomb that day. Like remembering an old favorite childhood hymn and remembering the words of their Savior, the things that he had taught and shared the joy and the hope they had found in Him. The light broke through their darkness in their time of waiting. And they got up from that place and they ran to the disciples and the other followers of Jesus and they proclaimed that Christ is risen. And in that moment, they became the first people to testify to the risen Christ, the first people to pass on the truth of our risen Lord. May it be the same for us today as well. 
whatever period of waiting you may find yourself in now or in the future, whatever period of darkness you may find now or in the days to come, may you never forget, but remember that the God who gave his life on a cross and was resurrected so that you might remember the truth that you are loved and nothing, not even death, can stop that truth. And may, like the early, the light of the early dawn rising on the horizon, may that truth pierce any darkness in your life. May you chase after it, run to it, and proclaim that good news this and every season. Amen. I invite you to join with me in an attitude of prayer. Holy and gracious God, your love is truly amazing and that you never give up on us. For this we give you thanks. We celebrate the gift of your son Jesus Christ and that he is a risen living savior. We thank you that in times of darkness we need not despair, that we can know that he is alive and that you are at work in our lives and in the world around us. So may we place our trust in you. We thank you that because Jesus lives, we can face our tomorrows amidst uncertainties, amidst fears, amidst the unknowns in life. So go with us, live in us and through us, and may we share your good news and the good news of your love with all whom we meet. It's in Jesus' name, the risen Christ, that we ask these things. Amen.
Amen. Amen. What a glorious day indeed. But let it not stop here. As we celebrate and we sing praise to that glorious name of the Lord, as we celebrate the joy that we find in remembering the good news of Christ's resurrection on Easter Sunday, may we then take that with us as we go forth from this place and share that good news. And maybe for you, maybe one way that you can remember that you can hold on to that good news is by finding a place, a family of faith where you can be encouraged and strengthened in your faith week in and week out. If that's the case, then we'd love to have you join us here at the Stillwater First United Methodist Church. I invite you to see myself, Pastor Kyle, or Pastor Cindy before you leave today. Or if you're watching with us online, give us a call, send us an email. We'd love to set up a time to get together with you, get to know you, and talk about what it means to be a member of the Stillwater First United Methodist Church. To be a people who at Easter and at all times of the, the year seek to share the good news, to pass on the truth, and to live for Christ. so much for joining us for Easter. Go out, have a happy Easter, and go out and live Christ. Pastor Kyle here one last time, and I want to say thank you for joining us for our Easter worship service. We have remembered the women who went in the dark hours of the morning before the light had even fully entered the world. They went in faith to go to the tomb. And I know that in our lives, sometimes we find it being dark as well. And I hope that each and every one of us can go towards Christ, that we can have the faith that the light will enter once again into the world and into our lives. And so maybe you want to connect with a family of faith, a place where you can learn more about how you can experience the light of Christ in your life. And so I would invite you to reach out to me at kanderson at fumcstw.org. I'd love to hear how we can connect with you, our online worshiping congregation, and hear more about how we can be an Easter people together who share the good news that Jesus Christ is risen indeed. Go forth in peace and as a risen people this day. God bless and happy Easter.